Thank you, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope this is not too awkward. I can't see you, you can't see me, but hopefully you can see the slides that I have prepared and hopefully you can hear my voice clearly. Um, please let me know if not, maybe I can then come closer to the microphone. So I want to talk about uh, the survival of science publishing in an open access world uh, a little bit. I won't make it long. Uh, but there are a few things, a few background things that I want, uh, would like to address and a few uh, um, pointers to where I believe we ought to go. Um, first of all, open access. Uh, very often I hear, you know, ideological and so on. I don't believe that for a moment. I think it is a response to a, uh, uh, a changing environment, a fundamentally changed environment. And let me illustrate that with a uh, picture out of my background as a geologist originally. Uh, some 65 million years ago, give or, give or take a, a, day, a few days, the, uh, the Earth was hit by uh, a meteorite. And uh, that had uh, major uh, consequences. The atmosphere was uh, so uh, changed so much that uh, the dinosaurs, as you all know, uh, could not survive any longer and other land animals neither uh, because of the change of environment. They were not killed by the uh, meteorite, it was the environment that did it. And I think that what we see at the moment is something that hit us, and I, 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 I used to call it the license sphere, and I abbreviate that, uh, abbreviated that as the Earth sphere until I uh, uh, came to the conclusion that that's perhaps a, a bit unkind to one of the major publishers. Um, but anyway, the sphere, the knowledge sphere, let me call it knowledge sphere, is uh, impacted uh, tremendously by uh, the possibilities of the internet. Uh, maybe a few more pictures to illustrate that uh, uh, more clearly even. Uh, when the meteorite struck, the dinosaurs uh, were finished. Not all of them, a few were able to survive in different shapes, in different forms, like birds, crocodiles, and, and the small number of mammals that were, that were uh, on Earth then were able to then um, um, radiate out into many, many species of which we are, of course, one. Uh, if I take exactly the same picture, uh, <laughs> then, but then um, um, you yeah, see the Internet as the, as the uh, change, the change maker here, the, the, the thing that changes the environment, uh, you can basically draw a very similar picture uh, except then, uh, instead of an animals, we are talking about um, publications and forms of, of publication. Um, what really changed is the zeitgeist, the, the, the spirit of the time. And uh, I will not be comprehensive, but I have a few, few uh, points, a few things that change in the zeitgeist that, uh, that I think are relevant. Um, open access is inevitable. It is inevitable just because it is possible. Well, it is possible to communicate in, uh, in, a, in a more direct way via the internet, then, um, uh, then it will happen. It will just simply happen, and nobody can stop that. It may uh, be uh, delayed a little bit, but it, it will happen. Another thing that we see is a trend of not paying for information anymore. And that is not true just for science information, that's true for many forms of information. It's very difficult to uh, sell uh, information now. Uh, and as a result, we, I think we've reached something that I would call peak subscription. Um, we all know what that uh, means. <laughs> there are a few other things. Um, the uniqueness of each paper, which is one of the reasons why the current uh, science publishing uh, um, e ecosystem is uh, surviving the way it is, that is under threat. Now you think, is it really so? Uh, are people really publishing the same things over and over again? Well, maybe not quite yet, but the uh, idea is showing in a way uh, because we have, uh, of, of many papers, we have the official version, the green version as a self-plagiarized version of the officially published version. Another thing that, ha that happens is that pre-publication peer review is under threat. Now, uh, why would that change the atmosphere? 
uh, of a publisher. Now, if that's under threat, then uh, publishing itself is under, under threat. Uh, that is to say, the role of uh, formal publishers is under threat. And we see uh, a number of uh, post-publication, peer-review um, services um, spring up. And of course, a thing that helped uh, uh, sustain the ecosystem in the past was uh, the impact factor and the influence of the impact factor is also decreasing as we all know. Now, on the issue of impact factor, I like this analogy uh, rather much. Uh, this is nowadays uh, the impact of a science publication. The impact is felt, of course, by the journals, but not so much by uh, anybody else. And if you throw a feather in the John Cannon, wait for the echo, then you have an idea of what the impact factor really means, the impact really means. Now, in the print era, uh, publishing was, of course, about uh, peer review, although that task was really a, an academic uh, task. But publishing itself, publishing per se, was about dissemination, because there was no way you could disseminate a papers so widely as an individual scientist. Um, it was about preparation for preservation, not the preservation itself that took place, uh, uh, that, that, that was done by, by librarians, but it had, you know, the material had to be prepared properly for preservation. I still think that that is the case, by the way. Uh, if you want to preserve um, scientific publications properly, they have to be well prepared, which is not always the case, certainly not if uh, scientists do it themselves. And of course, a very important uh, thing in uh, the traditional uh, way of publishing in the print era was career advancement. You need uh, to publish, uh, preferably in journals with a high impact factor, uh, to advance your career, to get you know, your funding for the next uh, uh, project, to get uh, uh, tenure, etc., etc., to get the Nobel Prize eventually. But in the internet era, that's not the same anymore. Um, as I said, dissemination is not something that, uh, uh, that, that can't be done without publishers. In fact, it's uh, often a lot easier without publishers. Uh, anybody can disseminate their material on the internet very, very quickly and easily. Um, in preservation too, the, uh, the need for uh, formatting for preservation is still there, but uh, preservation itself, of course, is not, uh, I, I shouldn't say not, it's diminishing uh, as a role for libraries uh, it is, um, suppose you have all your articles in PubMed Central, then uh, the, the preservation role of libraries uh, for, those, for that material is gone. Uh, career advancement, I think, is still a residual role, but we have to be very really careful there because uh, it can change overnight, more or less. If uh, funding bodies and tenure committees decide that uh, it doesn't matter where you've published, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, that can change very, very quickly, too. We were supposed to talk about audience today. Uh, well, let's then. Um, traditionally, you get the idea that most people think about audience uh, uh, and they th when, when, when they think about readers. However, uh, I don't think there is such an adage as read a lot. You can get away without reading a lot actually. Different it is for authors. Uh, publish or perish is a very strong adage. And uh, you have to publish. Without publishing just as well, you know, uh, uh, your, your research is, is just as well not done at all. Um, so authors, I think, are a far stronger audience uh, to cater to than readers. Uh, libraries, well, if everything is open access, uh, if there are no subscriptions, um, I'm not too sure that libraries have strong, uh, you know, are a strong audience for publishers. The fact that authors are a strong audience for publishers, of course, led to the whole model of um, uh, author-side paid um, open access. Because an author has the choice of where to publish. The reader doesn't really have the choice of what to read. Um, because if you, if you want to read uh, you know, up on, on uh, a certain topic that you're interested in, you have to read pretty much everything that's available in that area. Uh, so, yes, the drivers I just talked about that. Is, uh, now, is it possible to read everything? 
uh, that's of relevance to your field. Uh, a few years ago, Alan Fraser and Dunstan uh, published something in the British Medical Journal, uh, and they came to the conclusion that it is not possible. Uh, they called it being an expert in echocardiography. That's, to me, that sounds like a fairly small field, but the upshot is that uh, if you really want to, um, want to read everything in, in that small field, you still need a lifetime of reading and you have absolutely no time for anything else. Now, that's unrealistic. Uh, you can't do that. You can't read uh, everything. That is a big problem in its own right, and that problem is, is only getting worse. But we have to realize that um, uh, this, this is a picture that, that depicts a scientific article. You think, uh, does it? Yes, it does, because a large part of any scientific article is what I call waffle and only a small portion is, is representing you know, real knowledge. Now knowing that uh, gives us a few clues as to what we might be able to do. Um, if we have an article and we are able to identify the important bits in an article, the import, important assertions, and are able to see whether they have been used before in other articles, then we are going to read articles very, very interestingly. Uh, this example shows you a number of uh, assertions in an article that um, are new or have been seen elsewhere. The green ones are new. Uh, that is to say, we haven't been able to see them anywhere else. But this is not done on a very large body of, uh, of paper, so they may still, uh, be, may still find them somewhere else. But the blue ones are definitely found somewhere else. And we can provide a link to the articles that um, uh, that have essentially the same, semantically the same statement. It doesn't have to look the same, but semantically it is the same. And then um, we can find those other articles. Now just, just imagine what that means if you want to read papers. Uh, you're, um, you will be able to find relevant other literature even if it's not, uh, if it's not referenced. I think that is a very interesting uh, thing that can be done, and of course, we are so far. This can be done nowadays. I'm not aware of any publisher offering it, but it can be done. Um, this is the statement in question that you can find them in, in, in the other uh, papers uh, listed here. And uh, a simple click on the PDF uh, there will collect that article for you if you have the rights to that article, of course. So what are the options uh, for responding to the situation of uh, the changed environment? I mean, should we really preserve as much as possible from the old days, or should we do everything, everything we can to adapt to the new environment? Obviously, I think the latter, but there may be, may be difficulties uh, with that. Uh, it may not be easy to go to from where you are now to an open access uh, uh, publishing environment. Uh, you may not have uh, the wherewithal to do it. You may not have the stakeholders or shareholders uh, who would uh, allow that because it may come with consequences for uh, your business. Uh, but let's, let's think about what the audience really is again. Uh, this reading, I think, is, is, is a very tricky thing. I mean, people seem to read, but are they really? Are they not just download? Uh, my, my contention is that the real audience is always, always was, and still is, the authors. The authors, they have a need to publish. You really need to publish, because otherwise you can forget your career. Uh, that always was the case. Uh, although it looked like uh, competition was taking place um, you know, in the market, but the market really was the authors. Uh, a good publisher used to, used to make sure that the authors were happy, because if the authors weren't happy uh, and the authors weren't offered what they needed, the business was, uh, was, uh, was going down the drain. Uh, the usage, um, what we see as usage, usage isn't often uh, uh, usage. We see downloads. The downloads, is my feeling, uh, are very often you know, just guilt relief. Uh, if you download something, then you have, you, you, you've done something, and that is okay. It's the equivalent of making a photocopy in the past 
put it on the pile, and then you, you've done your duty, more or less. Um, now, a very large part, portion of the usage, I understand, is still PDF. And um, that has a very good reason. It's convenient. You can keep it. You have it. You have it on your own machine. Uh, and it is the same every time you look at it, uh, which is not necessarily guaranteed for URL, not for an HTML version. And of course, it's perfect for this guilt release. So what you see is that people use um, the articles uh, by downloading them just in case they need it later. Now, uh, let's talk about the, the options that you have. If, if, if you allow me, and I'm sure that many of you do, then why, why do you let it happen in the repository? And why don't you uh, draw people who want to see those green versions to your own site? Um, the green embargo, we all know, is under threat. Um, we, you know, we, we, we could see this happen at the moment. Uh, uh, the, 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 from one year, it's now already pushed down to six months. That will be pushed down further and further. Um, so instead of looking at uh, two different versions, the, the officially published version and then the manuscript version, which is typically the green version, why don't we uh, look at uh, a low functionality version versus a high functionality version? And that gives us a possibility to, to uh, employ a premium model. Um, a reactive versus a, uh, a proactive, a proactive uh, uh, approach rather than a reactive approach. What we could do, for instance, is um, make the low functionality version just available for human reading. That addresses a very important portion of what open access advocates uh, always wanted, although not all of it, but uh, it, it definitely is something that would would help uh, uh, enormously. And, and if the higher functionality version is for sale in the traditional way, uh, the, the, um, uh, the sales potential of that is not undermined by having a low functionality version out there, in my view. Uh, because the low functionality version may not at all be suitable for a true uh, research or study environment. Uh, it may just be suitable for those people uh, in, the, in the general um, public who might want to see papers, uh, occasional papers, for, for whom it's fine. But if, if in, a, in a university environment you really want to do something with, with the literature, uh, then you need the high, fun the high functionality version. So what is this high functionality all about? Well, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, this is an article from uh, in, in uh, PubMed Central. And what we've done there is uh, highlighted concepts of uh, scientific significance. And uh, this, is, this is just an example. And what, what you can do is, if you then want to know a bit more about BRCA, BRCA1, for instance, you can bring up a number of links to more information about that. Now, the, the links uh, and the number of links depends on very much on the, on the type of, uh, uh, of concept that you, uh, that you click on. Uh, but this gives you uh, far more functionality than you would have in a normal paper. This is available these days. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that you might uh, consider uh, implementing uh, on your own material. Uh, another thing is if you have uh, uh, PDFs, and we just saw that uh, you know, a very large percentage of the, of, the, of the downloads are PDFs, you can enrich those PDFs as well. This is an example. If you normally have a PDF and you see a, a reference, uh, in, in brackets, uh, in number 12 or whatever, uh, you, you, you typically have to scroll back to the end of the article and then see what the, what the real reference is. Now, what we can implement here is just uh, uh, clicking on one of, those, uh, one of those references and you get the full reference. And what's more, uh, you see the, uh, the PDF logo and what you could do is you could pick up that, that, uh, that PDF straight away if you have uh, the, the, the credentials, of course, to, uh, to get it. If it's open access, obviously, always will be able to pick it up, but uh, it will be possible to recognize your uh, IP address, and if you have a subscription or your library system has a subscription, you will be able to pick up that article straight away as well. The enormous convenience here is something that would 
I would call the high convenient, the high functionality uh, element of the table. But there is more. Um, you can nowadays, um, uh, if you have a, a table in an, in an article, you can uh, make convert that table into a, a, a scatter plot. So that you can see trends more easily, which are difficult to discern, uh, especially in large tables. But here you can see in a, sc a scatter plot uh, what, what the possible trends are. Um, there is more if you have um, uh, a structure formula of a protein, um, then you can actually render that uh, in, in dynamically. You can you turn it around and, and watch it in 3D, just straight from the PDF. And uh, you can bring it out, um, and then you can even render it in a, in a different format as well. This is all possible uh, nowadays, and this is what I. These are examples of the sort of high functionality that uh, I am sure will be possible to sell, uh, whereas the, the plain text you can uh, then make available in a premium model for those who uh, just want to read, uh, read the text. Now, I'll end with a quote from Cameron Malon. Uh, I'm sure you all know him, uh, a plus at the moment. Uh, any publisher, if they want to survive, has to compete with the free circulation of scholarly documents. That's not just the great literature, but also the circulation of copies of the version of record. And that competition is, is, is got tougher. And it got tougher with the advent of the internet. And we have to bear that in mind. There is nothing uh, that we can do other than uh, try to deal with that. And this is where I'd like to end. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Jan is going to—he's uh, going to stay on the line, uh, and we'll participate in uh, Q and A and, and discussion um, at, at the end. Um, thank you, Jan. And next up, we have Susan. Uh, 